Good evening, everyone. In this session, we will discuss about HRCT in interstitial lung diseases. Uh, whenever the patient comes for the interstitial lung disease evaluation, first and foremost thing is optimal scan acquisition, getting good sets of images for the interpretation of the interstitial lung disease. Then we have to differentiate whether it is a fibrosing interstitial lung disease or it is a non-fibrosing one. And in fibrosing interstitial lung diseases, we have to first identify and also rule out the UIP pattern and it must be excluded first. If UIP or uh, IPF pattern completely excluded, then we have to uh, go for the non-IPF diagnosis and point out the particular pattern. So the following protocol we are using in the interstitial lung disease pa uh, patients, uh, supine and inspiratory images, which are volumetric. So the axial, coronal and uh, sagittal reconstruction can be made. Supine and expiratory images. Prone images are taken in the selected patients in whom basal abnormalities are suspected, but uh, the picture is not much clear. To confirm the findings, we take the prone scan. And during this whole protocol, the radiation dose must be between 1 to 3 millisievert. Interstitial lung diseases, we are going to classify as the fibrosing one and non-fibrosing ones. In fibrosing ones, that uh, UIP pattern or IPF pattern, uh, it is must to identify and rule out it first. And in non-IPF pattern, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it is the most common uh, disease pattern in India. It is the most common interstitial lung disease as per Indian registry. Next is sarcoidosis, non-specific interstitial pneumonitis, combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema, and end-stage interstitial lung diseases. In non-fibrosing varieties, we have few cystic ILDs as well as smoking-related interstitial lung diseases that we will discuss in later part. Now, why it is so much important and it is emphasized to identify UIP or IPF pattern. If we see the treatment part in this uh, table, the drugs porphenidone and antifibrotic agents, they are exclusively used in treatment of IPF. They stop the progression of the fibrosis. They uh, do not reverse the fibrosis, but they help to improve the quality of patient life. And these are very costlier drugs also, and they are having, uh, like they have significant side effect profile. So it is very much important to identify UIP or IPF pattern from treatment perspective. Once it is diagnosed on CT, there is no need of surgical lung biopsy. So once IPF or UIP pattern is picked up on CT, we can avoid surgical lung biopsies. And overall, if we see uh, the uh, prognostication in UIP or IPF pattern, it is uh, very much bad in comparison to other interstitial lung diseases. Five-year survival rate is very much poor. So uh, it is uh, important if uh, UIP or IPF is uh, picked up in earlier stages, the prognosis can be explained to the patient. Now, this is a case of 70-year-old male who is presenting with progressively increasing breathlessness. And what we see in this case is significant honeycombing in basal segments. Uh, as Sir has shown in uh, previous, uh, previous lecture that uh, cystic spaces which are sharing their walls there are, that are piled upon each other, they are known as honeycombing. So we can see honeycombing in this uh, uh, lower lobes in subplural regions. And if we see the distribution of the findings, we can see the upper lobes and the apices of the lung, they are relatively spared. So this is the classical UIP pattern or usual interstitial pneumonia pattern in which we can see the apicobasal gradient, apices of the lungs, they are spared and there is predominant basal and subplural involvement. Honeycombing, it is a core feature of usual interstitial pneumonia. If basal and subplural honeycombing is present, we can confirm, say, on CT scan that it is a UIP pattern. And if uh, no cause is identified for this UIP pattern, we can label it as a idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Another abnormalities are reticulations, uh, which can be intra and interlobular septal thickening and traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectric changes. These findings in basal and subplural region, if they are seen without honeycombing, we can say only that is a probable UIP pattern and we cannot confirm the diagnosis on CT scan. If we see the similar patient on coronal sections, what we see, there is a clear-cut demarcation of diseased lung parenchyma and 
normal lung parenchyma by a straight edge. This is known as a straight edge sign. And when straight edge sign, it is seen in cases of UIP, it in, uh, indicates underlying connective tissue disorder. These are few other signs which help us to identify the underlying connective tissue disorder. In first two images, we can see the straight edge sign. In third image, we can see significant exuberant honeycombing in the lung lobe. It is involving more than 50% of, of lobe and it is commonly seen in rheumatoid arthritis. Similarly, anterior upper lobe sign where we can see honeycombing in the upper lobes in anterior part that is also commonly seen in rheumatoid arthritis. Then island-like fibrotic areas in corners of the lung, this is commonly seen in uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, cystic lung destruction that is also commonly seen in uh, 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 SLE and uh, four corner sign means fibrosis involving the antero superior and postero inferior corners of the lung. This sign is described in literature for scleroderma. So these are the signs of connective tissue disease, fibrosis or variant fibrosis, which uh, help us to identify underlying connective tissue disorder associated with UIP pattern. So which are the signs which suggest uh, non-IPF diagnosis? If we are dealing with extensive ground glass opacities, extensive nodular patterns, cysts in the lung parenchyma, mosaic attenuation pattern, or we are having findings or fibrosis, which is predominantly in the upper and middle lobe, then we are dealing with the non-IPF diagnosis. In non-IPF diagnosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it is the most common type. And in initial stages, it shows ground glass opacity, areas of air trapping, ill-defined central lobular nodules. But as the disease advances, there is progressive fibrosis uh, that is uh, centered around the bronchi, bronchocentric fibrosis and involving predominantly upper and middle lobes. So this is a case of hypersensitivity pneumonitis where we can see diffuse areas of ground glass opacity throughout the lung parenchyma. We are seeing areas of air trapping, this black areas in between. And uh, if we notice carefully, there is a development of uh, intralobular septal thickening and some of the reticulations, which is indicating that this is a subacute phase HSP with areas of ground glass air trapping and somewhat fibrosis. As the disease advances, there is significant fibrosis that is bronchocentric in nature, radiating from the uh, center to periphery. And along with this, we can see triple density sign. Now, what is triple density sign? We can see areas of ground glass attenuation, areas of air trapping, as well as the normal lung in the single slide. This is known as uh, triple density sign or Hitch's sign. And it is very sensitive for the diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Another condition where we can see bronchocentric fibrosis is sarcoidosis. What happens basically in sarcoidosis, it is uh, the disease around the perilymphatic distribution. So the granulomas or nodules, they are formed around the bronchi as well as the interlobular septa, subpleural interstitium. And when these granulomas undergo cicatrization or fibrosis, they lead to significant bronchial angulation and distortion, development of linear reticulations along interlobular septum. Significant alveolitis is also there in sarcoidosis, which leads to formation of honeycombing that is often peripheral as well as central and uh, associated with uh, upper and middle lobe involvement predominantly. They are not usually seen in lower lobes. Pulmonary hypertension and mediastinal adenopathy, they can be supportive to the diagnosis of sarcoidosis and they should be looked for in mediastinal windows. So this is a classical case of sarcoidosis where we can see a significant destruction of right upper lobe with honeycombing formation. We can see large honeycomb areas as well as central as well as peripheral honeycomb areas. We can see peribronchovascular masses or soft tissue opacities which are leading to fraction dilatation as well as irregularities. And uh, we can also see some of the nodules in perilymphatic distribution. We can see uh, nodules in the subpleural spaces as well as along the uh, bronchovascular markings. If we see the distribution of findings, there is relative sparing of the lower lobes and this is, that is classical for sarcoidosis. Again, in this case, we can see uh, peribronchovascular masses which are causing deformation of the bronchi as well as the angulation of the bronchus.
Next fibrosing condition is combined pulmonary fibrosis with emphysema. That is, uh, as the name is suggesting, uh, it is showing fibrosis in the lower lobes as well as emphysema, which is associated with smoking in upper lobes. It is exclusively smoking associated condition. What we see in the image is that uh, uh, there is significant emphysema in the upper lobes uh, as it is a smoking associated condition and there is developing fibrosis in the lower lobes. We can see traction bronchiectatic changes as well as areas of honeycombing. NSIP pattern or non-specific interstitial pneumonia pattern, it is commonly seen in uh, association with connective tissue disorders. Ground glass opacity, it is a core feature in NSIP, which is associated with cellular phase. Reticulations, we are seeing in later part of the diseases as the fibrosis advances, and we can see intra and interlobular septal thickening, which is associated with traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis. What is uh, uh, discriminating NSIP from UIP pattern, uh, despite it, it may cause fibrosis, is uh, no apicobasal gradient is seen in NSIP. There is diffuse involvement of the lung parenchyma in NSIP pattern. There is often subpleural sparing that would not be seen in all cases, but whenever it is seen, it is specific for the NSIP pattern. So this is a case of scleroderma. We can see iso significant esophageal dilatation, which was associated with scleroderma and interstitial lung disease pattern. And here we see areas of ground glass opacities, interlobular septal thickening and traction bronchiectasis. And there is classical subpleural sparing, which is indicative of NSIP pattern. Now in non-fibrosing interstitial lung diseases, First of all, we will look at uh, smoking associated interstitial lung diseases. Uh, respiratory bronchiolitis ILD, that is the commonest in, smoker, in smokers. What happens in smokers when the smoke is inhaled and the nicotine, it is uh, deposited into secondary pulmonary lobule. It incites inflammatory reaction and this leads to formation of multiple centrilobular ground glass nodules which resemble cigarette burns. Now, this condition is completely re reversible with cessation of smoking and with use of steroids. But once the fibrosis sets in, then it is not uh, significantly reversible. Disquamative interstitial pneumonia, it is a smoking associated condition where there is significant lung parenchymal inf inflammation, which is involving both the lung fields. And uh, we get uh, significant larger areas of ground glass opacity in this condition. Langerhans cell istiocytosis, that is also smoking associated condition in uh, which initially there is centrilobular nodules which goes on cavitating. This leads to formation of uh, irregular thick wall and this bizarre shaped cyst. As it is a smoking and associated condition, the middle lobes and lower lobes usually they are spared. It is predominantly seen in upper lobes and sometimes in middle lobes. Lymphangial leomyomatosis, it is a condition commonly seen in females as well as in patients with tuberous sclerosis. What we get in this condition is multiple cystic spaces which are thin-walled, distributed throughout the lung parenchyma and uh, involving the lung basis as well as the costophrenic angles. If we compare the Langerhans cell istiocytosis and lymphangial leomyomatosis, we get irregular and bizarre shaped cysts in the Langerhans cell istiocytosis, which are having distribution in upper and middle lobe with sparing of basal segments and costophrenic angles. In lymphangial leomyomatosis, we have smooth wall cysts, which are distributed throughout the lung parenchyma and involving costophrenic angles as well. Lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, it is a, a common pattern which can be seen uh, associated with immunodeficiency syndromes like HIV, lymphoma, Jogren syndrome, as well as in amyloidosis. What we get in this condition is thin-walled perivascular cysts, as well as diffuse areas of ground glass opacity. Now, this pattern can be non-specific and we require a strong history correlation to diagnose this condition. Organizing pneumonia, it is a condition where uh, there is uh, inflammatory plugging of the alveoli. There is also plugging of the terminal bronchioles. And so it is also known as bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia. What we get in this condition is perilobular ground glass opacities, perilobular consolidations, 
perivroncovascular ground glass opacities and sometimes the ground glass surrounded by consolidation which is known as reverse halo sign now these consolidations they do not go away easily they require longer duration of treatment with steroids and so it is important to diagnose organizing pneumonia pattern on hrct so uh, what are the important points in hrct evaluation of interstitial lung disease first uh, thing is history correlation smoking is having specific interstitial lung diseases associated with it similarly connective tissue disorders allergy history important for hypersensitivity pneumonitis drugs like amiodarone also cause lung fibrosis HIV and immunocompromised status are also associated with LIP like interstitial lung diseases as well as pneumocystis carrying in pneumonia. Acquisition of good sets of images for the interpretation of ILD that is the most important preliminary step in the radiology. And uh, then we have to identify the non fibrosing versus fibrosing diseases and exclude the UIP or IPF pattern first, depending upon the disease specific abnormalities and typical distribution of abnormalities. Mm -hmm.